I have a great story. It was back in the 1980s. A student here decided to read up on all, all these special bylaws of the university. And he saw in the bylaws any student sitting in an examination is entitled to a glass of port. And he says, whoa, this is fantastic. So he's inside the exam hall over here and he calls over one of these porters <laughs> and he says, um, my good man, by the bylaws of the university, I am entitled to a glass of port as I sit by examinations. Ah, right, sir, says the porter. And he goes away and he duly returns with a glass of port. And he gives the port to the, uh, to the student and uh, he's delighted with himself. Hey, I got one over on the porters. Isn't this amazing? I, got, I didn't really. So he finishes his exam, and as he's walking out of the exam hall across Parliament Square here, he gets a little tap on the shoulder, and it's this same porter who says, Excuse me, my good man, but I now fine you the sum of £50 for not wearing your sword and your scabbard as you cross the <laughs> <laughs> Another one of those pesky little bylaws. <laughs>
this time at the monastery of Kells. And this time the, the Vikings stole the book. Now they were not interested in the beautiful pages Bad inside, Vikings. they were pagans. So they just ripped the cover with the jewels and the gold off the book and they threw the book away. It was subsequently discovered by a farmer tilling his field. Oh my gosh. Under a sod of turf, according to some annals date, dating back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is where the book was found and it was returned to the monastery, although they never recovered the, the, the cover with the, with, the, with the gold and the jewels. Over the years, we've lost about 30 pages of the book, but 340 pages remain. So obviously we missed the cover and the front and back pages when it was ripped off. And then just through the sands of time, 30 pages were either destroyed or went missing. And also in this part of the exhibition, we will see two older books that are a hundred years older than the Book of Kells. So about 1300 years old, the Book of Molig and the Book of Dima. Sort of slightly more primitive versions of the Book of Kells, but, but still fascinating nonetheless. I have a question for you. Sure. How did it not deteriorate if it was buried? A very good question. And that's part of what you can investigate. When we have a look at the Book of Kells, you can go around and just see how the book was manufactured. It was manufactured on calf skin, okay. or vellum. vellum. So they would skin the poor unfortunate animals. I think 185 of them were used in the construction of the Book of Kells. They would strip off the hairs, they would soak the skins in salty water, and what came out is this brilliant white um, parchment. So it wasn't paper. If it was paper, we wouldn't. We wouldn't have it today. There's no two ways about it. Uh, so this brilliant white paper, which was ideal for this kind of work, because if they made a mistake, they could erase it. They could actually just mm -hmm. scrape it and, 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 and change it. And they made lots of mistakes. They were human beings, after all. So they have found little messages in the margin saying, Oh, I'm really tired today. My back hurts. I wish this day would end. And so on. <laughs> <laughs> they have identified four distinct ar ar artists <coughs> responsible for the Book of Kells. Uh, also the inks that they used. There are little um, displays inside where you can see the inks that they used. They had to make their own ink. They used rainwater because it was pure, wasn't contaminated to mix the inks and get beautiful, beautiful pages like this. So this is the very well-known library at Trinity College, which they call the Long Room, you can see why. Has over 200,000 books. And each year they take each one of these books down, clean it, do any restoration that's necessary and put it back and then they start all over again. This is the Jedi Library from the Star Wars movies. And if you look at the photograph, it's completely modeled on this building here, on this room here. George Lucas wanted to film here, but then he decided to uh, just go all CGI. And um, Oscar Wilde studied here. Bram Stoker, author of Dracula. Jonathan Swift, author of Gulliver's Travels. Um, uh, George Bernard Shaw. All of these people studied here in the Library of Trinity College. People ask, 
um, can you still access these books? Yes, you can if you make a special appointment. Um, they bring you into a special room. You have to wear the white gloves. Gloves. Uh, but if you're a scholar or a student, you still can make a special request to to access some of the books here. We're going to look at the oldest harp in Ireland now, and then I'm going to give you some free time. I learned on one of my tours that the harp that represents Ireland faces mm -hmm. Ireland faces one way, and the Guinness harp faces the other way. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which is which. Sure, absolutely <laughs> right. absolutely. I've been on a lot of tours this week. <laughs> this is the Brian Baru harp. It is the oldest harp in Ireland. Now, Brian Baru died over a thousand years ago. But this harp is not a thousand years old. It's more from the, the 14th, 15th century. It's still the oldest harp in Ireland. Arthur Guinness, when he founded his company in 1759, he decided to model his logo on this very harp here. So when you see a pint of Guinness, this is the harp that you see. Now, when the Irish government, they also wanted to use the harp uh, as their logo, you know, their emblem, I should say, their logo, their emblem. Ireland is the only country in the world that has a musical instrument as its national emblem. And they also modeled their harp on this very harp, the oldest harp, the Brian Baru harp. However, they did not want to upset Guinness, who had the, who had the emblem two, 200 years beforehand. So it's the same harp, but it's reversed. It's the mirror image. So we just finished the tour of the Book of Kells and the library. It was really, really fascinating and really worth seeing. I want to tell you though that if you do this, especially if you do it on your own, get here first thing in the morning. Um, it gets very, very busy very quickly and um, you'll have very limited time and a limited view of the books themselves if you don't get here early. Um, our tour began at 8.15. I think it was about 8.30 when we when yeah. we actually went in um, and we were able to get right up next to the books and more or less look at them at our leisure our tour guide is great I will put um, information down below in the description about the tour company they only do t um, tours first thing in the morning for that reason and uh, but I highly recommend doing it with a tour group because he gives you a lot of information that um, you, it's in the information center but it's nice to have somebody explain it to you and you're able to ask questions. So now we've just taken a bat, little bit of a bathroom break and we're going back to meet with Brian and our group and he's going to give us some history of Trinity College. Alone. And she is uh, Dublin's unofficial mascot. There is a famous song, I'm sure some of you may have heard of heard it. In Dublin's first city where the girls are so pretty, I first had my eyes on sweet mind. Molly Brown's very hard to uh, sing it with the musical accompaniment in the background. But it goes, alive, alive, oh. The final verse is very sad. It's, she died of a fever and no one could save her. And that was the end of sweet Molly Malone. Our ghost wheels her barrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and muscles alive, alive oh. A molly or a mall uh, was a nickname for somebody who had maybe one job during the day, like a flower seller or a fish seller from a, from a trolley or a cart, but maybe a lady of the night in the evening time. places to store um, all of their their wares so they used to store them in these little underground yeah. so you may have heard people say Dublin was literally built on on on, on vats of whiskey <laughs>
our tour this morning was fabulous. It took us um, almost exactly three hours, so just make sure that for planning purposes that you know that. It left at 8.15, and it leaves from Trinity College, but it ends at Dublin Castle. You don't end back at Trinity College. This is the Guinness Storehouse. We're not going to do that this trip because we did it before. It is worth doing, particularly if you like Guinness. Um, you get a free one with your entry ticket and there's a bar all the way up on the top of the roof that gives you a 360 degree view of the city. It's called the Gravity Bar. Mark likes the Gravity Bar. Yes, and the floor below that, they will actually teach you how to pour them perfectly. How to correctly pour it. Yeah, so and you he, can be certified if you want to. He got to have two free ones because I don't drink beer, so. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal.